uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. She's a radiation oncologist trained at Duke University and Johns Hopkins, and she's going to give us an update on radiation therapy. Jane. Thank you. I'm excited here um, to spend a few minutes with you today to talk about radiation therapy and some of the topics that we are currently very excited about um, in terms of prostate cancer treatment. Um, in case you're not familiar with radiation therapy, I was just going to talk a little bit about basics. So most of radiation treatments in the United States are basically given with these machines called linear accelerators. Um, the radiation is being generated by a linear accelerator, for example, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, um, and there's no radioactive material anywhere in the machine or the room. The radiation is present only when the tr machine is on. And on the right side, it's basically an artistic dis depiction of what a beam would look like. The beam is invisible. You don't actually see anything coming out of the machine. Um, but basically, the beam travels through the body and treats the area that we're trying to treat. This is, of course, different from brachytherapy, um, which is radioactive seed implants that's used in prostate cancer treatment quite, as w um, quite often as well where you actually are taking small radioactive seeds and implant it into the prostate. In that scenario, the man's prostate is radioactive, a little bit radioactive for a short period of time, but most radiation treatments in the United States are given um, in the form of external beam radiation with various kinds of machines. Um, there's been a lot of evolution in technology for radiation treatment. The goal has always been to kill cancer cells and try not to kill too many of the normal cells that are in the way. Um, in the good old days, kind of on the left-hand side, um, we did radiation kind of in the rectangular box form, which means you take an x-ray, you guess at where the prostate should be, you draw a rectangular box around that area, and then you give radiation beams. And so the three images are all basically an axial CT slide through um, the low pelvis, and the prostate is in the middle of the screen. Um, there's a little bit of, you can see rectum behind the prostate. You don't see the bladder, which sits above the prostate, and then you see the um, femurs on the two sides as well. But in the good old days, the radiation was more rectangular box shape, so you treat the prostate, but you also treat a fair amount of normal tissue around the prostate. More recently, we've been moving towards something called IMRT, intensely modulated radiation therapy, which instead of using a rectangular box-shaped radiation, you have a lot of different beams coming from a lot of different directions that are all shaped like the, um, the area that you're trying to treat, so in this case, the prostate. And you're giving a still high dose to the prostate itself, but you start giving a lot less dose to the area around the prostate. In the more recent years, there's also been a lot of um, increasing availability of proton therapy in the United States as well. We also have a proton center here open in Seattle. And the major difference there is that the radiation beam goes into the body and it does not come out the other side. So it stops after a certain calculated distance. So it has the potential for further decreasing um, dose to normal tissue. Um, I think in radiation oncology, as we become smaller and smaller with our radiation beam, you also need to be certain that you know then where your target is because you don't want to miss the prostate as you're treating. And so it's also led to the evolution of IGRT. It stands for image-guided radiation therapy. Um, all it's saying is if you want to be precise, then you need to know where your target is. So for a long time, um, and we still do this as well, we've Unfortunately, you can't see the prostate on an x-ray, but you can implant markers into the prostate so that you can see the markers on an x-ray. So that's what the top two images are showing, that there's four little markers that are implanted into the prostate. And there's been various um, levels of sophistication with this as well. Um, and there are systems such as Calypso that um, have the ability to even allow tracking of these beacons so that even as you're, you know, lying on the treatment table for a few minutes and there might be a small amount of motion in the prostate, those beacons can track the motion. Um, besides x-rays, there's also been evolution in technology so that there, you can now do a daily very low-dose CT scan called comb beam CT before you give the radiation treatment. So on a CT scan, you can see the prostate itself much better than you can on an x-ray. 
Um, we certainly do believe in validating um, the evolution of technology, and so our center, as well as many other centers, for example, proton therapy centers across the country, are participating in a randomized trial called PART-QL, Prostate Advanced Radiation Technologies Investigating Quality of Life, looking at a comparison of proton therapy versus IMRT for patients with prostate cancer. The trial was initially started by the Massachusetts General Hospital with the Harvard Group in Boston, and we are participating in the trial as well, and basically it's taking several hundred men um, who have prostate cancer and they're being randomized to proton radiation versus IMRT and looking at quality of life actually as the primary endpoint. Um, something that's a fairly recent development um, that actually has nothing to do with radiation, but we're very excited about it in the field of radiation oncology, is a new product called the Space OAR Hydrogel. Um, and even as a radiation oncologist, I admit that the best way to avoid radiation side effects is to not give any radiation to that particular organ. And so, unfortunately, I think the quote was well said that, you know, the prostate is in a tough location. It is right below your bladder. It is right in front of your rectum. Um, and, of course, the urethra travels through it as well. And the space or hydrogel, basically, it's, um, it's a very simple concept, but it works beautifully. It is a gel that you inject between the prostate and the rectum, and it pushes the rectum away from the prostate. So I see a lot of men, you probably all had rectal exams, you know, you probably know that there's a patch of your rectum that's right behind your prostate, and no matter how precise we are with the radiation, you are always going to give some radiation to that patch of rectum. But with this, you can physically push away the rectum, and therefore you don't have to give it as much radiation. And so basically, you know, the gel, again, it's placed between the rectum and the prostate, and this is a slice, um, kind of a zoomed in slice of an axial slice of what the anatomy relationship is between the prostate um, and the rectum. And basically, when we do radiation treatment, there's always going to be a little bit of high dose radiation that exists for a few millimeters around the prostate itself, and unfortunately the rectum is within that few millimeter margin. Whereas when you inject the gel, which pushes away the rectum, now that rectum is no longer within the high dose region, so you're going to drastically decrease the odds of some kind of side effect from the radiation treatment. The gel is supposed to stay in place perfectly for three months, and then it's absorbed by the system and you pee it out um, before the six month mark. So this actually was tested in a randomized clinical trial of the of a few hundred patients, half got radiation, half got radiation plus the gel, and what they were able to show is that, you know, on the left-hand side, patient reported incidence of rectal pain was much lower when you use the gel versus when you do not, and the rate of any kind of rectal toxicity was much lower at the one-year mark when you use the gel versus when you do not. Um, to kind of further, they did follow patients out for further as well. So at the 15-month mark, on the left-hand side, it's the control group who did not have the gel, just radiation treatment. And you have about a, you know, about one out of 14 patients will have some kind of rectal toxicity. It can be as high as grade three, meaning you have to intervene somehow um, for the side effect. Whereas when you use the gel, it's about one in 49 patients have any kind of um, bowel toxicity. And really, most of them are pretty mild and transient and require no intervention. So we are very excited about the program, um, and we have started launching this um, and offering it to our patients um, starting this month, actually, in conjunction with our colleagues in urology. Um, another d exciting development in the field of radiation oncology is something called stereotactic body radiotherapy, or SBRT is the acronym that most people know it by. But basically, it's talking about using very focused radiation so that you're treating less normal tissue. So you can now give treatment in very few doses. Um, conventional treatment for prostate cancer radiation is usually given daily, Monday through Friday, over the course of about eight to nine weeks. Um, with something like SBRT, you're usually talking about somewhere between one to five treatments, um, period. It's kind of like a very advanced form of IMRT. The picture is meant to depict that it's showing the bony structure of the low pelvis as well as the prostate, and then the yellow is the rectum right behind it. And basically, you're just using a lot of radiation beams coming from different directions that all converge on what you're trying to treat so that you get a high dose around your target but a much lower dose elsewhere. There are a lot of different machines from different companies that can do 
do this, but CyberKnife has probably been by far the most successful at advertising, so a lot of people have heard of CyberKnife. Um, gamma Knife is another kind of word that a lot of people have heard of, but Gamma Knife is specific for the brain, um, whereas CyberKnife can treat um, larger areas from head to toe. So not only has it been used for you know, curative treatment of prostate cancer, it's also starting to be used for oligometastatic prostate cancer, meaning you know, if you have prostate cancer and has spread, but it's only spread to a few spots, it's in some scenarios worth aggressive treatment to those spots as well, in addition to systemic therapy such as hormone therapy. And so usually these SBRT treatments, they're one to five patient, outpatient treatments of about an hour long each. They're generally, depending on location, well tolerated with very high rates of local control. The image on the left is kind of showing the more traditional way of treating a prostate that may have spread to one of the vertebral bodies in the spine. Um, this is a section across the chest, so there's the heart, there's the two lungs on the sides. And basically, you're kind of seeing that it's a more rectangular box-shaped radiation where you have the vertebral body and you're just kind of aiming a rectangular box of radiation at it, whereas kind of with more sophisticated radiation, you can tailor the dose to more tightly conform to the vertebral body itself. So you can give a higher dose that's more effective over fewer treatments. Um, we can do this for bony metastasis, but we can also certainly do this for lymph node involvement as well, which happens pretty commonly in prostate cancer. So these are three images of the same patient, an axial slice, a coronal slice, and um, a sagittal slice as well, and basically showing that you can focus radiation um, to a very small region. And this has also facilitated a re-irradiation, meaning perhaps you've had radiation previously um, to an area, but we need to give a second round to a smaller area inside that site because perhaps years have passed and there is now a recurrence in that region. Um, in terms of looking towards the future, I think you know radiation. We're looking forward to perhaps becoming more than just a local therapy, meaning that for a long time, you know, radiation worked where you point the beam, but um, it does not work where you do not point the beam. Um, but we're excited about some of the recent developments, and I think we have a whole session um, dedicated to immunotherapy later. So I won't speak much about this, but. Radiation, you can use it to zap a tumor. It will cause, especially now that you can give very high doses, like with SBRT, it will cause a lot of death in that tumor. It releases a whole bunch of you know, tumor proteins, antigens. And we think that this may be used as kind of a boost, like a vaccine, where your body will, and immune system will now see a flood of all of these tumor you know, proteins and perhaps generate an immune response with it. Um, radiation by itself is not adequate for inducing the response, but in conjunction with some of the new immunotherapy agents that are out there, it can be kind of work in conjunction with each other. So this, for example, is a case report that was published a few years ago um, in a very prominent medical journal, a New England Journal of Medicine. And this in particular is talking about a patient with metastatic melanoma, which is a cancer that's treated very often with various kinds of immunotherapy agents. But um, it's talking about something called the Abscofal effect, which is you zap one spot with radiation and you see response across multiple spots that are not treated. So what the images and the timeline on the bottom right are showing that this is a patient who who had metastatic melanoma. They were placed on an immunotherapy agent called ipilimumab, um, which helps to basically, it's called a checkpoint inhibitor. It helps to activate the immune system so that it kind of starts to be active against cancer cells again. But initially, the patient received several doses of this medicine, his cancer, which had spread to, there was a small tumor kind of on the top. It's talking about small tumor next to the spine in the chest. There's also some lymph nodes um, in the chest that were involved. There was a spot in the liver and multiple spots in the spleen. And initially, the patient's tumors were all stable on this medicine, and then it started slowly growing on this medicine. Finally, the patient started having pain in his upper back um, from the tumor that was in the chest next to the vertebral body. So they gave a fairly high dose of radiation, the SBRT, to this tumor. Um, so A and B are showing the slow progression of the tumor on the medicine. C, the column that's in the middle, is basically when they decided to give some radiation treatment to the spot that's in the back. Um, and they gave three fractions of SBRT. And then D and E are showing that over time, the spot in the back that was treated responded to radiation, which is not shocking. That's what we treated. But actually, they surprisingly saw that the other spots that did not see any radiation, like the lymph nodes in the chest, the spot in the liver, as well as the 
multiple spots in the spleen also disappeared. Um, so it's a combination effect between the radiation and immunotherapy. And this is something that we're still trying to understand and exploit. Um, and we hope to have exciting results coming out of this in the future for other kinds of cancers, including prostate as well. So I think my very last parting word about radiation is it's not just about the, te the technology, which is very important. It's also about making sure you have a doctor who knows how to use the technology. So thank you. Thank you.